bedside or hope the margins of life or hope wherever we are, we want to hope I And um, I'm, I'm going to raise some questions and then I'm not going to answer any of them. And <laughs> I think yesterday that I had come up with my own definition of hope and I will share that at the end and then raise some more questions that I will answer and hopefully that maybe you will. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to in my thinking where I am. I started out analyzing hope theories and I analyzed the theories of four different authors. I looked at William Lynch's Images of Hope, Imagination as Healer of the Hopeless. I looked at Eric Fromm's The Revolution of Hope for Humanized Technology. I looked at Hutznecker, Arnold Hutznecker, Hope, The Dynamics of Self-Fulfillment, and Ezra Stockman, The Psychology of Hope. I analyzed and critiqued all of those books. Yeah, I still have questions. But I focused on Fromm for this particular uh, presentation and paper because of Fromm's emphasis on technology. He said that he wrote the book because of his concern that rapid increases in technology was leading to dehumanization. He defined hope as a decisive element in any attempt to bring about social change in the direct direction of greater aliveness, awareness, and reason. He then gave a whole lot of characteristics of hope. He said that hope is an inner readiness that of intense but not yet spent activeness. He said hope is paradoxical. It's being ready at every moment for that which is not yet born and yet not become desperate if there is no birth. He said hope is the mood that accompanies faith and sustains it. And then he said that hope can be judged least by one's words and phrases and more by facial expression, their way of walking, their capacity to react with interest to something in front of their eyes, and their lack of fanaticism, which is shown in their ability to listen to reasonable argument. He also says that hope is a state of being, a psychic concomitant to life and growth. And then he said, while faith is the certainty of the uncertain, hope is the mood that accompanies it. So, you know, we're at a philosophical showdown. Rejoice, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Repent, this could be your last day. Um. <laughs> so my questions, the perplexing questions. So Bill Joy, said in 2000, in his um, seminal article, his seminal work, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us. We are being propelled into this new century with no plan, no plan, <coughs> no breaks. So in light of this, one of my questions is, what hope can we express? And what hope can we encourage in light of that? The Gospel of Philip says, those who say they shall die and then arise are confused. If you do not receive the resurrection while you are alive, you will not receive anything when you die. This is why it is said that baptism is great, because those who receive it shall live. So most of the time in Christendom, we talk about hope of resurrection after death. Wouldn't hope for resurrection in this current existence be better? And then in Corinthians, it reads, and so faith, hope, love abide. Faith, conviction and belief respecting man's relation to God and divine things. Hope, joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. Love, true affection for God and man and growing out of God's love for and in us. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your great quest. 
So the greatest of these is love. Why are we talking about hope? Why are we talking about love? So those are those are the questions that I will not answer. So over the years, starting uh, early in the 60s, the Scott wrote his, his book in 1969, but really getting pumped up in the 80s, there's started to be a lot of writings and research about hope. Um, this was from 1989, Norman Cousins, who said that, that uh, hope can make you well. And he talked about the effects that love, hope, and faith can strengthen the immune system, but was focusing on hope. And he concludes that such research is making obsolete the scientific notion that the central nervous system and the systems that control the immune and endocrine function are separate. And then there was uh, this article in uh, the easily readable, somebody said yesterday, USA Today, uh, from 1984, saying, pushing past despair to the future. The psychology of hope is the, the headline. And it gives a little box there telling you how to build your hope. It says, hope is a skill you can learn. And And then along with the research and the articles written there were then the naysayers, you know, uh, saying, ah, all of this is just snake oil, this is not going to work. Um, he says in here, and this is a physician, David Hellerstein, he says, in fact, a whole new research specialty called psychoneuroimmunology has arisen, which is beginning to assess the complex interactions between mind brain and body, particularly the immune and endocrine systems. But the advocates of hope, I'm still reading him, the advocates of hope are too impatient to wait for real scientific evidence. In reading the hope writers, it becomes apparent that one is reading quasi-religious works which rely on belief rather than evidence. Can it hurt to hope against hope? I think so. So from the literature about this time, there are all these articles being written, and I drew up this model to show what these articles were saying. They were saying about hope, that hope can increase self-care action, it can prevent illness, it can uh, solve the progression of disease, that it can give you a better quality of life, and that it can delay death. All of those things hope could do. And then Bill Joy, in 2000, saying why the future doesn't need us, he comes in the midst of technology explosion, saying that we suggest that the human race might easily permit itself to drift into a position of such dependence on machines that it would have no practical choice but to accept all of the machine's decisions. As society and the problems that face it become more and more complex and machines become more and more intelligent, People will let machines make more of their decisions for them simply because machine-made decisions will bring better results than man-made decisions. The internet with soul. I wonder if we're about to lose our soul or our spirit in this mechanistic fashion. I wonder if we won't have the wisdom to apply our knowledge. We talked about knowledge before if we won't become victims of our own pride. Why are we here? Who are we? How did the genetic code come about? What is the human spirit? How does poetry come about? Love, all of the things that we hold near and dear, technology will not answer those questions. I hope that humanity will. And then he told the story of one of his patients who wanted a genetic justification to prohibit the marriage of his daughter to someone that he considered wrong for her. And so that's a very old thing, but it's one of the um, things that we have to think about or that we need to be thinking about when we talk about all the different uses of technology. We assume 
you know, because some of them go, oh, what's wrong with genetic testing? There's absolutely nothing wrong, but we haven't even yet imagined all of the ways in which someone could envision using genetic testing. But it's hopeful, hopeful that healthcare will benefit in the long run. So I'm going to move along to talking about the, how we treat our dads, talking about dying, because one, I've done a couple of um, studies. Uh, I'm going to just talk about the most recent study that I did here in this presentation, though the paper includes other studies as well. Um, I did one study that looked at the attitudes of Black Americans towards <laughs> the breakfast. And even though the topic of that study was not hope, you could see some of those things coming out. This particular study that I'm going to talk about now is a study that uh, Dr. Lee, who's a pediatric intensivist, and I did with pediatric intensive care unit staff. And we looked at those experiences. We just wanted to see how the pediatric intensive care unit staff experience the death of a patient. Because that's one of the things that when we talk about death um, in our society, the death of a child is still something that is incomprehensible to us. And so we wanted to look at these people who experience this on sometimes nearly a daily or shift by shift basis and see what, uh, what they would experience. And so these are the interview questions uh, in the semi-structured interview guide that I use for this. Tell me about the death, this patient, how would you describe your feelings, how did you manage them, how did the family react, tell me about the discussions about end-of-life care and what grand lesson do you think we should take away from this. The huge thing that we found from this study was that technology was a major, major stressor for, and a major moral issue and sometimes an ethical issue for the staff. Staff dis expressed distress about the technology. For example, one of the staff members said of a patient, she was basically being fully supported by us, but never did she show any neurological signs of being in there. Another one stated, you could tell he probably, he had probably gone to heaven during the night because he looked totally different. And I think everybody had a sense that they were just kind of perfusing the dead. One uh, patient, of one patient, a staff member spoke of the absence of life in the presence of support, saying, um, these kids are standing on the plank, waiting for someone to punch their ticket, and no one will. The only way a kid can get out of the pit you is to sneak out. So this, the whole idea of maintaining a patient on support, uh, and then the subsequent withdrawal of support was very emotionally laden. And even though they knew that there was a strong possibility that death would occur, occur in any rate. <clears throat> so mom was standing out in the hall and said to me, Doctor, is there any hope? And it's a tough question to answer. It's almost a philosophical, spiritual question. This is a position I'm interviewing. He said, can we tell someone that there is no hope? I mean, I can certainly tell them the likelihood of survival is very, very small. I don't think that your child is going to make it through, but can we tell them? Do we have the ability to say that there is no hope? I don't know the answer to that. And then another one. I know the parents need hope in that, but I think there comes a time when we're almost giving them false hope. <clears throat> And we felt like it was a disservice to the family for him to say there is still some hope out there when we knew there was really nothing we could do. So there was this constant tension in interpersonally as well as within each staff member. They were struggling. It was an amazing study. I the physicians were in my office. 
crying, um, just agonizing over things that they had done. Uh, there was a hemoc physician that I interviewed who was talking about not how hopeless he felt, but how helpless he felt. He said that the patient had developed um, an infectious disease that then they had to call in the infectious disease guys and he said at that point I just felt like there was nothing for me to do. He said I was helpless. They, were, they didn't need me anymore. And I mean this this agonizing and pulling and you could just see it and then there was one physician who talked about uh, putting a child on ECMO, um, extracorporeal membranous oxygenation for those of you who don't know what it's like during the work of the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys all at once. Just it's and they were talking about putting the kid. It's it's it's, it's kind of a horrendous technology when you witness it when you see a kid on it. It's kind of horrendous. Um, and to say it's a last ditch effort is not even expressing it correctly. But they're talking about having made the decision to put this child on ECMO, but then struggling, saying they knew that this was not going to help. And the reason they brought it up to the family was just because there is that technology. And they felt like because the technology was present that they had to bring it up. Family wouldn't have known about it had they not said it. But then they were crying about having put this child on the ECMO and then the leg turning black um, in that side of the femoral artery that they used. And just, it, it, was, it was just a horrible situation. And then talking about withdrawal or support, uh, one physician says, it's always very difficult. It's like I get this twinge inside because most times I mean, for the past 30 years of my life with medical school and training, and it's always about saving life and doing everything you can to save life. And so I guess it's this reflexive, almost like a panic, that it's a feeling of failure, basically. <clears throat> so one physician spoke of, of a shift from providing medical expertise to providing emotional <clears throat> support. He says, if it really seems as though we've gotten to some point where medical technology and knowledge is no longer helpful, then I feel a huge responsibility to at least provide some sort of support when the medicine has failed, then at least to try to be there as an understanding human being. <clears throat> and you might be thinking, wow, wouldn't you want to be there as an understanding human being even as you're using technology? And I think that's one of the gaps that is present, and I think that's why there's a lot of angst that is felt by the staff when they have to go through these decisions of putting someone on support and then removing that support. And then one nurse said, you know what, it's nice to see somebody say, okay, let's nature take its course, because enough is enough. But it was difficult because she was awake up until that point, actually. So we're talking about someone who was awake, who was fairly cognitive, but whose body was totally failing, and, and all of the interventions and technology had not assisted to reverse that process, and having to make that decision of, we just have to let nature take its course. And, and she said, that was good, but so there's this tension and there's this agony about it. So another physician said, I always get the same feeling when I feel that these kids may not make it. I start to get this dread feeling inside. I always find it very draining and that feeling isn't good. I always feel very depleted afterwards. In such a relatively short period of time, you're discussing things with them on extremely intimate, personal, very fundamentally uh, human aspects of their life. I hope they see some degree of understanding and compassion. We owe them at least that much. Medicine and technology don't have anything to offer. It's kind of very interesting that we have um, this reluctance 
to enter into that, enter into the dying process. Yet we have these uh, songs that people write and, and sing, and in these songs, they are very willing to go into that process. Death came a knocking on. Death came a knocking on my mom's door, and uh, she followed Death down to the Jordan Stream, and she said Hallelujah and crossed over. Uh, Sunday and Sister Jones, uh, Reverend Jones died, and Sister Jones said, if he, "God, if you take him, I don't want to live." So he died, and she said, then I'm going to go with it. And she said, thank you, Jesus, and she was taken away. So in, we see in these songs that there, there are others. You probably wonder, what kind of person sits around and researches and talks about death and then listens to songs about death? Um, that would be me. <laughs> but you, can, you probably wonder, why, how, how did we get there? How, how did we write and sing and we are so willing to embrace it, and yet we are fighting it to the nail in medicine, theology, philosophy. We don't want to die, we want to stay young. But when we sing about it, come on, thank me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So when we are when we are talking to family, we don't know. These things. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's real for them. We don't know what's ideal. We don't know how their past experience affects today's. We don't know what healing can take or what healings can take place. All of these things affect the hope that they bring or don't bring, as it were. And whether or not we can give them hope is a whole nother issue. I don't know if we can. That may be one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Oh, uh, good news. Our computers are down. You can go back until Monday. So you can get another day. And it seems like sometimes that's that's what we are doing. We're saying, not, not yet. I just want another day. So I have to bring this up because this just was like last week. Last week, week before last. When the news came out about the uh, technology and the experiments that CRISPR was doing, the, this popped on social media pretty soon afterwards. Uh, I follow several people who are friends of mine who are a member of the deaf community. And they were very concerned when this technology was announced. And their concern is that their community, the big D deaf, which they consider their own culture, which they have their own language, that, that the technology would be used to select out deafness so that no one will be deaf. And they're very concerned about that. But there are some people who would say, I don't want my child to be deaf. So whose hope then do we support? Do we support the deaf or hearing who hope to not have a deaf child? Or do we support the big D deaf who hope technology will not be used to make their culture obsolete. So, before I give you my definition, uh, I want to uh, just give you a quick anecdote of why I still have this tension and why I do. I think when we when we talk about things like this, I say that we have to both tolerate and resist ambiguity and disagreement. So we have to tolerate and resist ambiguity. We have to tolerate and resist disagreement. And I do that within myself as well. So some years ago, I felt led to go on an extended fast. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to learn from going on this fast, but I said, you know, I was going to do it because I felt led to do it. And so I undertook a 14-day water only fast. Um, around about eight, day eight or day nine, I was fairly weak, um, wasn't doing anything much but laying on the couch and listening. And then it occurred to me, if I wanted to, at any moment, I could have gotten up and gone into the kitchen and gotten something to eat. My epiphany at that moment was that hunger 
is the lack of nutritional sustenance with no hope or expectation of getting any food. So my definition then is my definition. Oh, it's not there. I'll read it. Hope is an inherent human longing for an experience by which one will transcend the current condition or situation to an imagined or yet unknown better. Hope is an inherent human longing for an experience by which one will transcend the current condition or situation to an imagined or yet unknown better. So the implied components of this definition are change and time and life, humanness. But all that did was lead me to more questions. Because if we have hope as a part of who we are, as a part of being a, a created being. If God created each of us with hope, then what can we mean when we say we gave her hope? Is it even possible then to give someone hope? Another question is that I ask myself is, what word is better than transcend to use in my definition. And the reason I thought of that is because I, I went back to my experience of, of that fasting, and I don't think that a person who was starving and now has food is having a transcendent experience in the way that we normally use that word, transcendent. So I, I, I did a, a different word or better word. And with this definition, as with Dr. Dockery's and Dr. Osborne's definitions of hope, how can there be anything such as false hope? Assuming that hopelessness or hopeless is not the polar opposite of hope, is the phrase lack of hope sufficient? And revelation, <clears throat> when the preacher is filled with the joy of the Lord. So we, by our emphasis, need to become conversant in the language and communication of hope, particularly because technology has to possess the potential to damage our common humanity and our imagined better. We need to creatively listen for hope that is expressed differently. We need to brainstorm about the foci of hope, and then we need to brainstorm again about that when we are using technology. And there we go. Thank you for the opportunity to respond to the Colorado's wonderful presentation. Since you didn't have your definition on your slide, I promise you I will have it, and I'd like to discuss it. Okay. So uh, we'll talk about that at, at uh, here's my, my technological enablement. So here we go. Uh, at my institution, I noticed that our mission statement, the very first three words are to inspire hope. Those words were added a few years ago. I like them. And this conference is giving the uh, richer understanding of how that plugs in, but I spoke to some of my colleagues and uh, what do we mean by hope? Uh, are we measuring it? Um, how do we define it? How, how can we know to do better at it? And, and um, we're still exploring those answers. We don't have necessarily good answers. Um, that's our mission statement. Uh, and everything we do for our patients hinges on how we understand and apply those words. Hope seems to be a simple idea at first until we gather like we are today to think about it and reflect on its meaning as we unpack this in the context of the complexities and perplexities of life and medicine. And we discover that hope has material, biological, neurobiological, mental, philosophical, medical, economic, and spiritual dimensions in at least as many definitions. Nowhere 
as the meaning of hope pressed more vigorously and our ability to sustain hope tested more fiercely than in the face of mortality, when hope confronts the existential reality of the valley of the shadow of death, in that valley in which we eventually find no exit, we hope against hope, that is, we long for a transcendence. We believe that the seemingly inevitable face of death will not have the final word. All of us who care for patients know the importance of hope in this twilight of life. And so the question surfaces, how do we sustain hope in our patients? Not only in our patients, but also in their families at the bedside and also in ourselves. Uh, because shouldn't we have a sense of hope in order to be able to sustain hope in our patients? Um, does our capacity to care uh, require us to have a rich understanding of hope uh, and a source of hope? So our mission statement elaborates that we provide this hope through integrated clinical practice, education, and research. And I find that each of these areas is impacted heavily by technology. Um, and so I, I wish to respond to Loretta's definition of hope uh, with an eye towards technology and what that means. Um, and and uh, here we go. Here's her definition to uh, university. Um, and if we look at the key words, hope is first of all an inherent something. Uh, it, that is, hope is innate, it's essential, a permanent aspect of our nature. It may be conditioned by experience. It, uh, and our, it, but it is not supplied by our circumstances. Uh, therefore, though our circumstances may assault our hope, uh, they cannot extinguish it if we so choose. Uh, hope, I'm implying there's an intentional aspect of having hope. Hope may be judged, as Clara said, by our facial expression, our way of walking, uh, words and phrases, intonation. All of those, of course, we know are brain phenomena. So they're all neurologically. Uh, these are external manifestations of what's happening in the brain. Uh, and what's happening in the brain may be a reflection of what's happening in, in the soul, depending on your model of, of anthropology. Uh, looking to the, the evidence of neuroimaging, we can start to dissect this and look at, at what is involved in hope. And hope engages the capacities for uh, language, cognition, perception, vision, hearing, uh, emotional processes, reasoning. <laughs> So many areas in the brain, there's not a hope spot uh, in the brain. Um, hope also requires the exercise of memory. Memory is fundamental. The ability to imagine a hopeful future draws from our ability to imagine uh, memories of the past. They both rely on the same circuits in the brain. Um, in fact, uh, studies have shown that the neural substrates for recalling the past have a parallel role in envisioning future possibilities and networks of neurons responsible for constructive episodic memory in particular are the same ones that allow us to simulate in the mind future scenarios and possibilities uh, from which we, we have uh, an idea of hope. Um, uh, patients with amnesia who have lost the capacity for memory, um, for example, have sustained damage to the hippocampi bilaterally. Uh, also lose the ability uh, to construct new imagined experiences. So memory is essential. Secondly, she reminds us that hope is a uniquely human phenomenon. Uh, that's not to say that there are no animals capable of hope. There may be animals with a rude memory sense. I think of a loyal dog uh, awaiting a uh, return of its master. But this is a past experience the dog is, is relying on, a repeated experience. Hope in the human mind is a further category Something beyond past experience is imagined. This capacity for elaborating on and imagining a future that exceeds past experience requires creative thought uh, that belongs to creatures uh, who bear the image of God. <clears throat> to say that hope is a specifically human quality demarcates a distinction, not only between humans and animals, but also humans and machines. Um, throughout recorded history, humans have tended to place hope in manufactured things. We have idols uh, mentioned in the Old Testament that cannot speak, uh, and yet people looked to them for advice. Um, and technology today has reached unprecedented levels of, of power. We see this in medicine. This tends to reinforce our perception that everything, even perhaps life and death, uh, are subject to human ordering and control. 
and yet we also see that ethical difficulties arise from the application of technology in medicine, and these complications uh, remind us that we are not in complete control. The trial in ECMO, we lost the leg. Um, put not your hope in princely technologies. Um, there's a further aspect to the humanness of hope, unlike machines which are locked into following their particular programming. Humans as moral agents are capable of intention. Uh, hope, therefore, is not something supplied by human nature, but is also something actively chosen uh, among a list of options. Third, oh, and I haven't advanced the slides, so human, uh, the long, the third, hope is not a stationary feeling, um, but a longing, a thirst for something more. Um, I'm careful to distinguish hope here from addiction, uh, which is an enslavement to an insatiable and destructive mental state. Now, longing is something different. It's a desire that yearns for something good, something lastingly beneficial. It seeks after that which satisfies one's noblest aspirations, and also something that we cannot find in ourselves. Longing must look upward, as the psalmist who, who said that as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Last night, Grant Osborne reminded us that the purpose of suffering is to drive us to God. Technology can palliate bodily pain at the end of life, and that can be helpful as pain serves its purpose. But when pain is constant and persistent, it can also distract us from reflecting on our faith in God. Uh, technology here can, be, can assist us in being able to redirect uh, and have the peace to focus and, and, and on, on our hope uh, in our faith. Um, so in this way, technology can be used for good, but it's not an ultimate good. Uh, technology uh, also introduces new problems that magnify uh, our longing for God, uh, whose promises infinitely surpass what life-sustaining bedside machines can do. Um, fourth, it's longing for an experience, uh, not just an abstract idea or a feeling, but something real that we participate in as bodily creatures. Uh, technologies, uh, we have now virtual reality technologies that kind of supplement or, or provide uh, artificial experiences. Uh, we have drugs that uh, affect the way we experience life. Uh, and, and some of these technologies connect us as humans. Some of them mimic human relationships and therefore ultimately disappoint. Um, um, so palpable technologies sometimes substitute an illusory uh, hope. And finally, fifth, hope transcends. Having judged the current situation, the status quo to be intolerable, uh, hope reaches past, even past the limits of human reach. Uh, in its reaching, hope placed in Jesus Christ encounters the God who reaches down to earth to bridge the chasm that we cannot bridge by our own effort. And our longing for transcendence, we sometimes apply technology toward projects that aim for transcendence. Uh, we may even perceive transcendence in technology itself. Uh, technological transcendence is a dangerously false hope. Uh, a bizarre example is, is cryonics. Uh, you've seen where they take the brain from the body, immerse it in liquid nitrogen, and it will surely in the future there will be a technology to restore the person from that. From that. Um, sixthly, hope imagines. Uh, technology can be used to allow us to visualize the content of hope, um, the printed book is an example, and with a few clicks I can go to the internet and pull out the Gospels, the book of Revelation, uh, and, and use technology to assist me in supplying the content of hope. Uh, hope is, uh, um, uh, and uh, clothed in what Edmund Burke described as the wardrobe of moral imagination. Uh, that is, the heart owns and, and the understanding gratifies. And this moral imagination draws from the brain's capacities to construct mental models of possible futures, to judge what ought to be, to reason why. Uh, we routinely use technologies to assist uh, our memory. I'm, I'm reading from an iPad. Um, and uh, technology allows us to preserve a record of past events that sustain our hope. Uh, it can also provide misleading information about a false future without God and much of contemporary science fiction comes to mind uh, in that category. Uh, hope reasons from what is known. It also requires that the future be unknown, that is open, uh, 
to inspire the imagination and to motivate action. Uh, yearning for but never reaching full certainty, hope requires a future open to new possibilities. If all of the future were completely certain, um, there would no longer be a need for hope. I don't think that hope will be lacking in the resurrection. Uh, without the possibility of hope, even a bright future would ultimately be a prison of despair. Uh, Tolkien writes about despair. He says it's only for those who see the end beyond all doubt and deny. Finally, uh, hope seeks what is better. What is better is the whole, is, is the crux of all of ethics. How do we define this? Our technology doesn't give us the answer. Uh, Claretta has given us glimpses through narratives that hope in general um, doesn't point toward technology. Sometimes it points away from it. Um, some of her patients recognize that technology is not the ultimate source of hope. When medical technology is substituted for real hope, medicine can become a caricature of itself. Um, technology works at the level of some facts, not value, of the mechanism of life, but not its meaning. We must decide what the meaning is uh, with help from God. So in conclusion, to hope is part of what it means to be human. Uh, to invent and use technology is also part of what it means to be human. Technology can wonderfully empower medicine to palliate pain and delay the arrival of death. We go astray, however, when hope and when hope and technology drifts toward hope in technology. Medicine supplies hope on this side of death. When that time shortens, as one nears the end of life, this pro the prospect of what comes after death looms larger. And medicine cannot offer hope for the afterlife. Uh, Bill Van Gemmer last night said that uh, quantum uncertainty, comets, asteroids, and other things in the universe, uh, in those things, God left us a puzzle. Uh, it is technology that allows us to look into these puzzles in science, these puzzles of nature. It is technology that allows us to see what happens in the body and in the brain at the margins of life, both at the beginning and the end, and also throughout the life. Span. And in these matters, God has left for us many ethical puzzles. 